The year is 1880. Following the 1857 War of Independence, the British Crown has taken direct control of the British colonies in the Indian subcontinent. To govern this massive land with over 300 million inhabitants, a new political institution is set up, the Imperial Civil Services of India, or simply the Indian Civil Services. The British administrator Sir John Strachey is responsible for training recruits for the Indian Civil Services. Strachey begins his lectures saying the first and most important thing to learn about India is that there is not and never was an India. Fast forward 150 years later into the future India's eminent intellectuals continue to echo Strachey even today telling us that there was no India before the British colonized us. In his book India After Gandhi author Ramachandra Guha calls India an unnatural nation because India is composed of too many diverse regions ethnicities languages cultures and so on Guha even mentions Strachey and quotes him Strachey had said that there is not and never was an India or any country of India possessing according to any european ideas any sort of unity physical political social or religious that men of the punjab bengal the northwestern provinces and madras should ever feel that they belong to one indian nation is impossible even karl marx had this to say about india india could not escape the fate of being conquered by england and the whole of her past history if it be anything is the history of the successive conquests she has undergone indian society has no history at all at least no known history What we call its history is but the history of the successive intruders who founded their empires on the passive basis of that unresisting and unchanging society. Almost all so-called intellectuals today in India would agree with Marx's view on Indian history. But how true is it? Did India or the idea of India as a unified entity not exist before the British? If there was no India before the British conquest of the subcontinent, can there even be Indian history? Let's take a look. Let's travel back in time to 1800 BC. As the river Saraswati dried up and people moved from the Sindhu Saraswati valley to the Indo-Gangetic plains, India began witnessing a series of political and cultural changes. Around 1500 to 1200 BC, India began undergoing massive urbanization. Several city-states, the Janapadas and Mahajanapadas, began emerging. Coinage was introduced and trade boomed. As the city-states became more organized, more urbanized and more economically powerful, they began warring with one another. This warfare led to political integration which then resulted in cultural integration. This is when the integration of the northern part of the Indian subcontinent including modern Pakistan and Afghanistan with the eastern India and Deccan began. This is when the idea of India that is Bharat began taking shape. But what geographical boundaries define this Bharat? The Vishnu Puran describes Bharat as the country north of the sea and south of the Himalayas. Various Hindu Puranas, Buddhist and Jain texts also call India as Jambu Dwipa, the land of the Jambu fruit. Later foreign travelers and observers also described the geography of India in a similar way. The Greek ambassador Megasthenes who was based at the Mauryan court in Pataliputra in 4th century BC described the land of the Indoi thus It has its eastern and western side till the south bounded by the great sea on the northern side it is divided from Scythia by Mount Hemados while the western side is bounded by the river Indus Ptolemy the celebrated geographer from the Roman Empire in the 2nd century CE defined India and her regions and claimed she was marked by Hindu Kush in the west, snowy mountains in the north, the Ganga in the east and the ocean in the south. Interestingly, he also spoke of an India beyond the Ganga reaching up till China. Yuan Zhang, the Chinese pilgrim who traveled to India in the 6th century CE, wrote that as he stood in Nagarhara, that is modern Jalalabad in Afghanistan, west of the Khyber Pass, he felt that he stood at the gateway to the country called Indu. He too referred to India as bounded by the snowy mountains to the north and the sea on three sides extending to an area of 90000 li and inhabited by 70 different kingdoms. The Arab traveler Al-Biruni in his 11th century Kitabul Hind describes Hind as limited in the south by the Indian Ocean and on all three other sides by the lofty mountains. The Mughal historian Abul Fazl in the 16th century Aini Akbari writes 
the sea borders Hindustan on the east, west and south. In the north, the great mountain ranges separate India from Turan, Iran and China. Intelligent men of the past have considered Kabul and Kandahar as the twin gates of Hindustan. Now a nation is not just its territory. A nation is first and foremost an idea. The idea of a jointly held sense of belonging to a common territorial and cultural entity forged by a shared history and heritage. So did the people of ancient India view themselves as sharing this territorial and cultural entity? Sangam texts like the Patirupattu and the epic Silapattikaram were also invoking the geographic imagery of India between the snowy Himalayas and Kanyakumari in the oceanic south. In the 6th century, the Indian astronomer and polymath Varaha Mihira in his Brihat Samhita describes Bharatavarsha with an exhaustive enumeration of her many regions and communities which includes everyone from Kashmir, Kangra and Peshawar up to Dravidas, Kerala and Karnataka and from Assam, Bengal and Odisha up to Punjab and Saurashtra. Perhaps there is no greater evidence of this historical idea of India than the stellar example of Adi Shankaracharya, the philosopher who travelled across the length and breadth of India and established mathas in the four cardinal directions Badrinath, Puri, Sringeri and Dwarka, symbolically evoking the extent of the Indian nation. Temples and pilgrimages also play a significant role in uniting Indians from different parts of the country. As Jawaharlal Nehru once said, India has for ages past been a country of pilgrimages. All over the country you find these ancient places from Badrinath, Kedarnath and Amarnath high up in the snowy Himalayas down to Kanyakumari in the south. What has drawn our people from the south to the north and from the north to the south in these great pilgrimages? It is the feeling of one country and one culture. For instance, the 12 Jyotirlinga shrines across India are revered by Hindus all over the country. The 51 Shakti Peethas spread across the subcontinent from Hinglaj Mata in Pakistan to Dakshayani in Tibet to Kamakya in Assam and Kanyakumari in Tamil Nadu stitch the geography of the Indian subcontinent into a sacred landscape. Epics like the Mahabharata and Ramayana do this too. Many communities along the Ramayan route have preserved landmarks and events associated with the epic. Kalhana's Rajatarangini links the origins of Kashmir's kings to Gonanda, a Kashmiri king who is said to have fought the great war at Kurukshetra. Coming to the south, proud Chera and Pandya kings in their inscriptions claimed kinship with the legendary kings who fought the Kurukshetra war. Even the Irula and Badaga tribes in the Nilgiris maintain hero stones dedicated to the Pancha Pandavar, the five Pandavas. Even India's northeast and its people claim a connection with the Mahabharat. Dimapur, the name of the largest city of Nagaland, is said to be a corruption of Hidimbapur, named after Hidimba. Bodos have a tradition of having given Rukmini in marriage to Krishna and claim to be descended from Narakasur and Hidimba, who are characters in the Mahabharat. The epics and India's sacred geography thus act as a device to unite and integrate the myriad regions across India with one another. K.S. Singh, an IAS officer who served as Director General of the Anthropological Survey of India once said, People continue to identify themselves with the epic traditions, associate places with the visits of the epic heroes and to recall people's own role in the growing and developing epic traditions. This may be bad history, but it is good myth and therefore good anthropology. So we see that over an enormous span of time and space and across a variety of contexts, the idea of India persists. And yet historians would tell you that India is an unnatural nation. The view that India was too vast and diverse to ever be one nation ignores the fact that the concept of India as a single civilizational unit embraces that vastness and diversity and acknowledges a common and unified cultural sphere. This is how India becomes one single cultural and civilizational entity and it was not because of the British.